least for one who knows. Our next guest is the author of several really novels, but most prominently the Walking Dead trilogy that he came for. So please help us welcome Jay Bonanzina. Thank you. Welcome. Well, welcome to the view. I'm oh, sorry. I'm doing well. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm an author, and authors are just hermits who are like mushrooms, live in dark rooms, and never see anybody. So, so this is so much fun for an author. It's so cool for an author to get out and meet readers and fans and stuff. It's just any author who tells you it's tedious is lying. Sure. So you actually, actually <laughs> I'm a tech writer, and I see it from computer all the time. It's lonely. It is lonely. But so did you naturally gravitate? Like, how did you become a writer in the first place? And, and and to me, it seems like these days it's it's really tough to be a successful writer. So there must yeah. be some drive. To... Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's a great question. That's a multi-level question. But but the first part, what? How, when did I want to be a writer, or how did I become a writer? I mean, people think I'm joking when I say this. I wanted to look. Like Rod Serling. I'm, I'm, I'm of a certain age where when I was a kid, when I was a little kid, I used to watch The Twilight Zone. And this guy would introduce the show, and, and it, I just want, I, he was so cool. He, the black suit he wore, you know, the mortician suit, and skinny lapels, and you know, his Kennedy esque hair, and his smoking. And I found out he wrote the classics, and he wrote the show. And I just wanted to be in. So that's what made me want to be a writer. I didn't know I had to learn how to write. I just wanted to learn how to dress. Did, were you also um, into the whole Twilight Zone creepy vibe? Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted, I loved horror. I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do my whole life. I'm very lucky because, you know, I, this is the ultimate job for a horror writer to be, you know, the house novelist for The Walking Dead, which it is, is like Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Pot. For a horror writer, what draws you to horror? Um, you know, another great question that I could write an essay on. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, so many things, but I want to tell you. I mean, this is a perfect example. Everything's going on here today. Horror is no zero pretension. Horror is not. Horror is meant to take you on a ride. And yeah, there's serious subtext in horror. That's what draws me as an intellectual. So you can explore really serious, The Walking Dead explores very serious stuff. It's a survival story. It's what you would do, how far you would go to survive. Um, but, but, but also, ostensibly, on the, you know, the, 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 the superficial part of it is a roller coaster ride. Is taking you down into those dark places. Strong, yeah, the strong and catharsis. Catharsis. One of the things I've always understood with horror versus other genres, whether it's movies or film or writing or anything, it, the author is always trying to get an emotional response from somebody. But when it comes to horror, fear is probably one of the most genuine emotional responses you're ever going to be able to get. Which is, I think, why so many people are drawn to horror in the way that they're all talking Sadism, it's not a good, it's just we, we go to these things for that emotional experience. And Very well said. Well said. I did want to say real quick if anybody has any questions in the audience, we have a mic here, please just step up to the mic. Don't be shy. We'll see you and, and we'll take those questions. I would, I would go as far as saying, just to add to what you just sure. said, that horror is really about love. And, you know, I get snickers and chuckles whenever I say that, but it's true because tell me, you know, you don't love, you know, Rick Grimes. Tell me you don't love Lily Call. Tell me you don't love, you know, Clementine. All these great heroes you have to love in order to be scared. Exactly. If you, if you don't love them, then it's not that scary. It's, it's not quite as. It's all that emotional yeah. attachment. They exactly. They just away from you. People, people love the villains. That's why you know people get you know Hannibal Lecter tattooed on their arm. It's 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 because of 
you know, that part of us that lives, if you're a parent, you know horror. <laughs> Every day is filled with horror if you're a parent. So you, I think you're right on that. I think that's really a part of it. Yeah. Are, are you a parent? I am a parent, yeah. I have two teenage boys, and that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me with The Walking Dead. I'm actually cool to my teenage boy. <laughs> you can't buy that. <laughs> they do. Yeah, they love them. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, she, she didn't make it. 
I, and I, I like jumped off my sofa and spilled my Doritos because that's straight from the book. Straight from the book. But it gave that the series that more oomph and more density to that character. So, you know, it's way too much information, but, <laughs> but it's a great question. I, I think I read that he said, David Morrissey said that he didn't really read the comics that much, but he really pulled from the novels. And I wonder yeah. how you felt with that. Have you had interactions with him personally? Not personally, but um, every, I, more than one person told me that, that he was sort of like using the books as kind of background, like study. And at first I thought I was being pumped, and they were just, you know, they were teasing me. That April Fools! He, well, he's not really doing that with your shitty books. I'm sorry. I just had the kid. I can't you, Jay. No, but I mean, it was true. It, it turned out to be true. It was really cool. And that, that scene with him and Rick bears that out. You know, that he was really, you know, bringing that to the writer's room. Right? Yeah, the writer's room. And pull from it, too. Yeah, the writer's room is amazing. They use everything. They're just. You know, they're like uh, mix masters, they're like DJs. They sample everything from all the mediums and then they bring it into the series in weird, interesting, like twisted ways. Like the, again, no spoilers, but those of you who have read Rise of the Thunder, which is the first book in the series that came out in 2011, <coughs> available at Table One <laughs> at 1 p.m. to 6 today. Signed, three autographs to buy a book. Um, will you read passages? <laughs> I'll do, oh my god, I'll do anything. I will come home and mow your lawn if you buy a book. <laughs> so I, I have no shame. Um, I actually signed a girl's sack lunch. I signed my sack lunch. Hell <laughs> yeah. Who's read at least one of the books? Cool. Well, the, if those of you who raised your hands, you might have read Rise of the Governor, the first one. And, um, you know, there's a family in that book. Tara is one of the sisters. I don't know if you remember the family. The father was ill, you know, with like, like, you know, emphysema. And, um, well, they show up in the series, like in this mutated version, which is fascinating, with Lily, who's sort of my hero. Like, Lily is my, my life's blood is Lily. I mean, I, I've started with Lily. She was just, it, this sort of goes to some of your questions. Lily was just a sort of a semi cameo character in comic book. She just showed up, killed a major character, and then vanished. I was like, who was that masked woman, you know? But Lily has become my central figure. I, I will have written, and by the end of my contract, eight, eight books, eight books. With, with Lily, so, you know, and she's based on that one right there. That's Jilly. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> They're based on a lot of Jilly. Just recently, Mary. stand up, Jilly. We just recently got married. Yeah. And they made us, they made us a zombie um, cake at the last walk of Stalker. <laughs> Two zombies, Topper, it was hilarious. But, um, have you yeah. She, have you read books? <laughs> She's okay. finishing the last one right now. Does she, but that's another you know, question I get sometimes. Is, you know, these characters, and I know it's true with Kirkman, I talked to him about it, these characters are based on real people. And, they, and, and, Kirk, and Kirkman and writers in general do this. You know, they take people they know from life and then spin them and embellish them. And those become characters in novels. And you can ask, you know, I mean, it just goes back, you know, generations. People have done this for, forever. But I, but Lil, Lily, oddly, is a simulacrum of Jilly. And, and, you know, she dresses like her, and she kind of loves things that Jilly loves and has influenced me. That's who Lily became. That's awesome. I have a picture. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. just for people who, who haven't read the books, can you sort of let us know what the mandate was when you started, and in general, what the books are? Excellent question. Um, when I first started, I thought there were going to be tie-ins, which some of you may know what I'm talking about, some of you may not, but a tie-in is a down and dirty job that authors do to pay the bills. They're sort of pot boilers. They're, they're, and, and God bless, 
tie-ins. I've done in my career, they're where they give you a script. Like, they give you the script for, you know, aliens. And you, you novelize the script. You just take that screenplay and you turn it into a novel. You just put the flesh on those really sparse scenes that are in a screenplay. And that's what I thought it was. And I, and I even said to Robert after I got the job, I said, so you're going to send me a script? And Robert's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what this is. I'm like, really? He goes, well, this is going to be a serious book. This is gonna be, these are going to be serious books. I'm like, awesome. That's sweet. And he goes, yeah, we're going to, you're going you're gonna to write them. I don't know how to write, Robert said this, because I don't know how to write books. I'm a comic book writer. I'm going to give you, you know, an outline. And it turned out he gave me, like, for the first four books, maybe eight pages, ten pages at the beginning of a book. And, and, and he goes, just do what you do. Just just turn it into a book. And his outlines were, were really hilarious and fascinating. Like, okay, they start here, they're there, they go there, and then they go here, and then one of them dies horribly. I'm sure they'll figure out something cool. <laughs> and then... <laughs> and it, but it, but I, 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 I love the process. That's how I work. I do my, my outlines like that, and I'm working on my own books. Just a sketchy outline. And finally, Robert said, you know what, Jay, this next four books, which I'm working on now, so you'll see if you come over to the table, um, there's a, we got a little poster for the next book, which comes out in October, it's called Descent. Um, Robert's just handed the keys to the family car to me, he's just like, you write it, you write it, just, just tell me what they're about. He goes, the only thing I ask, the only thing I ask, and this is because he's a comic book guy, he's a comic book guy, he goes, just start when the last one ended. That was my only mandate. Start when the last one ended. He wanted this like continuous, endless story. And so I, it was really interesting and cool, and I'm really proud of this new book. Will it just be your name on it? It's another interesting story I'll tell really quick. Um, Robert's like, I don't want my name on it. I don't want my name on it. This is Jay's book. Put Jay's name on it. Right. And then I walked around like this for a few days. And then I get this email from the publisher. It's like, what's this shit about Robert not having his name on the book? That's, that's not, or, no. No, Robert's name's going to be, what, you don't want to have, you don't want to have any sales? Money doesn't matter to you? Sales? I'm like, God, I knew it. Damn these publishing people, and and uh, and and so uh, uh, like he and, and then they talk to Robert. Robert's like, I'm serious. I don't know my name on the publisher. Like your name has to be on it. We made a deal with you or something, you know. And I, I was uh, I was sort of over my head. I just was waiting for them to decide. Finally, they couldn't decide. So I said, I said to them, I said, why don't you just make it like you know? Uh, yeah, I, I, I said just make make it a logo. Like make it Robert Kirkman's Walking Dead, you know, and then put you know Descent, a novel by Jay Lawrence in there, and everybody loved that idea. So that's what you're, that's where you're gonna see. Awesome, congratulations. Thank you very much. Good question. Thank you, Dad. Keep going. 
I was really fortunate. After a while, they would give me one more chance. He would just, just go. He'd leave me alone completely. Only once in a while, like the editor would send, one time the editor, the British editor, Macmillan, sent an email. And she's like, I'm just still wondering, there's a scene in Rise of the Governor where there's a lot of zombies in a church, and they've been in there for many months. So I'm just wondering um, why they don't eat each other. I got, you know, of course the publisher sends it on to me. Robert is a rock star, you know, it would take weeks to get an answer from Robert on anything, you know. So they send it to me, and I'm like, oh, no, you know, I screwed up, I messed up, this is a huge mistake, baby, I don't know. Well, they wouldn't eat each other, would they? And I was like questioning my existence for days, you know, and I'm like, like looking up references, I'm calling friends in the business. Some of these don't eat each other, you know. Do some, would that happen? You know, and and finally, like a week later, this email comes in from Robert, and it's copied everybody in this in the loop. You know, the publisher, the British gal, me, and he's like, "Zombies don't eat each other." Next question. <laughs> and that's all it said. That's all it said. I started, you're absolutely right, that was a daily challenge. 
to come up with new phrases. And I started getting um, scientific. I started, you know, just going to the Grey's Anatomy and then going like, you know, um, you know, the blast takes the top of the skull off and the cerebral spinal fluid <laughs> spurts, spews. <laughs> I can go I can go to the thesaurus right now. Do you do you look at video reference for any of this kind of stuff? I mean, I know that's a morbid question, but have you seen morbid things in your research? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know about other writers that write this stuff. I mean, mo many writers will tell you that it, 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 you'd be surprised how much of everything is pure imagination. You know, Mario Puzo never met a gangster. He wrote The Godfather, this is true, right? Actually, I can back this up by, you know, proof. He wrote The Godfather by visiting the New York Public Library and researching in the library, the old-fashioned way, with the Dewey Decimal System and cards and stuff. There was no internet, obviously. And he, he never met a single gangster or talked to anybody. So that is true for many people. But myself, I have seen and researched some really profoundly disturbing, sad stuff. So I've written nonfiction books. I wrote a nonfiction book about a horrendous disaster that happened in Chicago in 1915 called the Eastland Disaster. And it was a book, it was a, it was a ship called the SS Eastland that capsized. And 844 people were killed. It's the deadliest disaster in Great Lakes history. So I went to the Red Cross and their archives and I saw the actual war and, and, and so I, I've, and I've visited an actual war and, and but I've done that for my nonfiction more than my fiction. But that now I'm using all the time more than that. All the time. Tissue damage from you know ballistic tissue damage, most people don't really study that unless you're a pathologist or a you know military medic or something. But I studied that. I, I saw it. So, do you do you get Tom Savini? By the way, Tom Savini was in Nam. I mean, he, he saw it up close. He, he, this this stuff doesn't come gray. He's the same way. Uh, Tom Savini was sort of the Greg Nicotero's. I guess you'd say he was his forerunner. He like came of Greg has kind of taken over, taken over as the godfather of that kind of makeup. But and Greg's the same way. Greg studied it from from a reality standpoint. He knows what bodies are. Do you, when you're, uh, I mean, this is a heavy subject matter, and there's a lot of death. And it, do you get depressed, or do you, does it affect you emotionally to be in that world all the time? It's exactly the opposite. Well, I mean, do I seem like a grim, down, you know, gloomy, <laughs> gloomy gust? And this is true for many more. Like we talked to Robert, he's the same way. Robert's like just a happy go lucky guy. A big bear from Kentucky. He's friendly, just, just you know, down to earth. And and when most war writers I know are like that. It, it, it's, maybe it's catharsis, maybe we get out all our dark, you know, demons and stuff on the page. But so when I, when I finish, a, I really can attest to this, when I finish like an intense, horrific scene, death, and, and in, in The Walking Dead, it's not just gore, for gore's sake, it's not just fun, you know, zombie land, you know, it's, it's intense, people suffer. And there's grief. It's followed by grief. You know, the bullets will do damage and hurt families. And oh my God. So, and when I come off a day like that, I feel like, you know, as wise as a feather. It's hard to explain, really. I mean, maybe I need a shrink. <laughs> so, do you get depressed when you have to write a romantic scene or interpersonal relationships? So, the writer's like, oh, this is terrible. Yeah, like, oh my God. Just depressed for weeks when I have to do that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Good, how are you? I am wonderful. If you had to put your novels on another area other than the other, who would you have chosen? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question because uh, Robert asked me the same thing, and I, and I said, You mean other than Nishan? And Robert's like, Please, really, it's such a cliche you want to write about the Michonne. Everybody wants to write about her. Everybody's in love with Michonne. What is this, you know, what is it? Everybody's, I can't, get out of here, get out of my, but it was true, Michonne. I, I loved Michonne. I wanted to write from her point of view. I wanted to find out what 
church came from. But, and, and I got a chance to, in the fall of the governor part one, in the fall of the governor part two, also available at table one, $25.99, card cover, trade paperback, $14.99. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, ISBN yes. number. I'm sorry? ISBN number. ISBN number, 445. Very good. Yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but Lily has become like the most fascinating character I've ever written in my life, in my career. I've written 20 books, and Lily is so fascinating. And she's, she, in, in, in Descent, the next book that comes out, you will see Lily go through, you know, an amazing arc. I, I'm really not just giving you a commercial, you know, BS. Yes, it's really true, you know. So thank you for that question. Is Lily safe? No, no. But but you know what? That's everybody here knows the answer to that question. Nobody's safe in this universe. That's what. That's why everybody's here. That's what makes yeah, us so powerful. Yeah. Doesn't that just? Yeah. Everybody. And it's like you, you don't want your favorite characters to go, but. Just that fear that they might keep you on the edge. Right. As soon as that's gone, then it's not as cool. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, not as a, I'm, this is maybe Captain Obvious speaking now, but you know, the fact that John Bernthal comes to these conventions, he's always going to be part of this. Even when a character dies, you know, they, when they die, they become almost more, you know, associated with it in a weird way. It's like they just resonate. The governor's that way too. I find in, when I'm writing Descent, they go down underneath the racetrack. And I'm like, you know, the ghost of the governor still haunts these corridors. The smells, the echoes of the screams of people being, you know, tortured. And he's still there. I mean, these characters still, you know, live in these, in these stories. On the show too. On the show too. I, I, I have this thing where I actually, I don't know, it's, it's a little weird, but I actually think a lot of people have it too that I don't even realize it, where the experience of losing someone, a character that you care about, it's an emotional experience, and it's kind of rewarding in a, in a way, especially if it's not real, you know? Right, right. very well said. Yeah, it's That's just really true. a tactical experience. You For sure, on The Walking Dead, it was, you know, people cry, but you get in touch with something real. Right, you know it's working when that's the case. That's, that's what makes this so great. I'm convinced. Yeah. And the fall of the governor, parts one and two, we finally reached Available the at table one? Those? <laughs> those books? I, I believe those. Those are the ones we talked about. Okay. You finally reached the point where it matches up with the events in the comic book. Right, 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 right. How did that affect the how you were writing this? Because you were writing from a completely different point of view. Oh, my God. Of the comic book. That's, you had that structure. Yeah, 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 it's so interesting. You can ask me that because Julie was and I were talking about the same exact thing. She's reading the finale right now. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're asking, that's the right. There's a, there's a point in the book which many of you um, faithful comic book readers will, the minute you turn the page and you start reading it, you'll go, oh, okay, this is where he's locked into the comic. Frame per frame, you know. And so it was really fascinating. Like, there's a scene. There's a scene that Chili said, how much of that is the comic and how much of it is your sick, pathetic, dark, hideous imagination? And it's, it's, it's a scene where, you know, a, a character gets the top of their head, a living character, not a zombie, the top of their head sliced off. And in the comic, yeah, it's gross and it's disturbing, but when you're writing prose, it is, it is so over the top, disgusting. And but my modus operandi, and this is maybe um, a caveat for those of you who haven't read any of these books, is go as far as you can and go farther. Push the envelope as far as you can. You know. And I had this guy in the comic book. He goes out to you know take a leak to to relieve himself, and while he's relieving himself. <laughs> Michelle just slices the top of his head off like a samurai warrior, and his head just jettisons. <laughs> and then it was really fun. It was fun, but I had my little touch I had because it's prose, because prose is about detail. Comic books are not about detail. Comic books are movies, they're closer to film. You know, so comic books are about forward momentum and imagery. But it, you know, <laughs> comic 
hook against the top of his head, locked off, and I just had to continue to urinate it. I even studied it for you know a couple hours one day. Would you continue to urinate? Would your bladder continue to empty itself? The answer is yes. For those of you who are keeping track of this kind of stuff. Um, so the stream just keeps coming as he's falling over. You know, that was <laughs> well, and the element that you certainly had above and beyond the visuals of the comic, where you, you go on a lot about smell. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, God. So I'm reading these things, I just, I'm, I, that horrible odor, that, as yeah. you were describing it, it I, does have yeah. a different element to it, just the visual. That's really, uh, really lovely of you to say, um, because I have consciously try to bring that into it. Like that hasn't been a huge part of it in the comic, if, 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 if at all. And in the show, once in a while, they talk about the smell and everything. Oh my god, this book I'll come down and send. I mean, there's so much odor in that book. I even have one character, there's a scene in the book where one character's like, smell that? Yeah. It's probably about 50, maybe 75 of them. And then a paragraph is like, if it smells like rotting feces in a wagon filled with pus, that's probably about a dozen to two dozen. If it smells like the Grand Canyon filled with an ocean of, you know, maggot-infested meat marinated in, in, you know, bile, that's probably maybe a hundred. I mean, I, I started, you know, delineating. Well, I don't know. That's the nicest they were. And one, the governor is kissing Penny, and you do use the word feces uh, to describe the smell of that. I was just like, oh, God, it looked bad enough. But well, see, but, but see in, a, in a comic book, you see him lean down, and Roberts told me, I don't know, this is probably news to many of you, not all of you, because he doesn't share this stuff really a lot, even with me. But he goes, yeah, that was a mistake. I'm like, what do you mean? She wasn't, he wasn't supposed to kiss her? And he goes, no, 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 he was, he was supposed to kiss her, but it looks romantic in the comic book. And there is a frame where he just goes in for the kiss. There's a frame. Do you guys remember it? And it's, you know, he's, it's like that. And then the next frame, he like pulls away back in the frame. And I'm working with that as a prose writer. You can't just say, you know, he leans down, kisses her, and then he, he jerks back and goes, you know, you know, yuck. Unless you're, 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 unless you're writing the point of view of somebody who's observing, it's complex. If I was writing in Lily's point of view, she's peering around the corner of the apartment, okay, then maybe you would write it like that. But I put the, uh, another thing about um, what I believe is good prose writing is you go in to the point of view as deeply as possible. You pierce the scene and go into a point of view. So we. Well, well, the right point of view there was the governor's. It does not mean romantic in any way, shape, or Right. The river he just bothered me really he, I mean, he does, he does just want to give her a little, a little pat in the book. It's not romantic. Robert made sure of that, too. He didn't make many changes, but he didn't want right. any like weird incestuous stuff going on. But, but he does lean down, and then you can smell what he smells, and you can taste what he tastes. <laughs> it's pretty nauseating. I just was the like I will confirm that. It was not safe. So I'm going to let you all know that we have time for one or two more questions if you want to come up right now. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, now is the time. Um, so I noticed that when you're talking about these characters, you'll do a voice occasionally, the, the governor. Do you have the voices for the characters? Do you ever yes. speak it up? Yeah, yeah. When I do readings, I read it, I read it in a southern accent. You know, I read what I call my Ashley Wills accent. Because it just seems to call for that. It's like a southern gothic setting. And, and you can when you when you see the show, you know, you hear the ambient drone of like that southern cricket cadeated combine just outdoors, and it's beautifully done. It's, the sound work on the TV show is, is brilliant. I, I mean I'm a big fan of the comic, and I remember when the show first started, I was like, oh yeah, they're southern. Yes, yeah. it, it really yeah. adds something to it. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, well, we uh, are doing this thing with the panels where you guys are going to be the zombies and um, Jay's going to try to kill them. Okay. okay, we'll do one more question. But I'll tell you, just so you can have a little suspense. But, so this bullet is signed, so one of you will get a signed bullet from Jay in a second. 
said, Bob, Bob is becoming like a fully formed, huge character. What is Bob's last name? Wow, your hand keep right up. What is it? Wow, nice. Nice. Okay, you win. Congrats. You win. You guys win. Congratulations. All right, let's have a big hand for Jay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So have you? So you work with Robert Kirkman. How does that yes. collaboration work? Um, well, it's really unique because Robert, from the very beginning, did not want to uh, sort of, um, you know, Share his fuss numbers. over every word. He wanted to basically just give me an outline and then ha and then leave me alone and have me go off and make a book out of it. But he's. But that's one of the great things about the collaboration is that. I'll, he'll give me an outline and it'll tell me, you know, among other things, who dies and when and okay. how, you know. But very sketchy, you know, and I fill in all the details and, and you know, uh, we've done this on four books and he's, he's hardly made any changes. He's, he, he makes a few changes that are technical changes to match things up with the comic book or have continuity, timeline continuity. But for the most part, he just likes what I do. I remember I said to him one time, you know, people told me that you're kind of difficult, you're kind of exacting. And I, f I find you to be easy to work with, you know? And, and he kind of looked at me in, in his Robert Kirkman-esque way and he goes, well, if I didn't like what you were doing, I'd be the biggest dick you ever worked <laughs> with. <laughs> I'm like, okay, duly noted, <laughs> duly noted. And then I felt kind of good because, you know, like what I'm doing, he likes, we kind of just are on the same wavelength, so. Okay, cool. How is it different between writing, like, for the books and writing for the comics? Like, is it a different writing style for both? Or is yeah, it it's completely different. different. It's, it's, it's very similar to the difference between writing for, right, exactly, for film versus writing for a book. You know, film writing, screen, when you write a comic book script, it's not really meant to be read by anyone other than the team that's going to create the art and, and letter it and ink it and turn it into a, com a, you know, a comic book. So that's what Robert's brain is oriented toward. He's, he's got a, he is one of the most ingenious people. He's, he's like a savant with story. He know, cause I've, I've written these books that are like 90,000 words, 350, 400 pages. And they match this sort of sketchy outline almost eerily closely. Like one page will be like 50 pages of prose. And it almost is perfectly laid out in his outline. You know? Now I'm kind of nervous because this book I'm working on now, you know, Robert has set me loose. He's, Robert's like, you, you write these next books. I'm, I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to approve them. You <laughs> okay. know? So now I'm working on my own. I'm outlining on myself, and but it is great that he's he's given me the keys to the the keys to the uh, Walking Dead station wagon, and I'm taking it on a joy ride. <laughs> now, besides Walking Dead, are you working on? Have you worked on other different books as well, right? Yes, um, I've written 20 books. 20 total of my own. Um, some of them are nonfiction. Oh, okay. You know, I write, I write, uh, but but even the nonfiction books I write are, are about sort of dark subjects or disasters or, you know, I wrote a book about um, the country's first inner city police detective who became the, our first detective in the year 1848. His name was Alan Pinkerton, and he was the father of the Pinkerton dynasty. And um, it was a fascinating story that I just became obsessed with, and I, I worked on that for five years. And uh, you know, so the, the nonfiction books I write take a lot longer, and you know, they're a lot more involved in terms of research and stuff. But they're dark. I mean, they're you know, I got a review one time in, in one of the free weeklies in Chicago, and it, the review of one of my books began: "Disaster's been good to Jay Boninsinga." <laughs> 
and I wasn't yeah. sure how to <laughs> exactly how to how to react to that, but I, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> or maybe they meant I'm profiting off of people's misery, but yeah. either way, <laughs> either way. It's all good. I think they meant it as a compliment. Right. We'll take it that way. Cool. Now, what advice would you give to like a young writer? Um, well, you know, I get, you know, there's a lot of advice to give. I mean, and in this, in this, in, in the a, a, the age we live in now is very different from when I started out, which I, I I guess most people can say in the business. You know, it's very different now than when they started out. I guess it's a cliche, but boy, is is the digital universe different from the analog one that that I started in? I I started out small, and that's the advice I give to most uh, beginning writers, start out small. Write a short story and perfect it and submit it to websites or magazines, literary magazines that publish short fiction. Um, short horror fiction, there's still a market for it. Mm -hmm. That's how I started. I wrote short horror tales and mystery tales for magazines like uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, um, you know, Twilight Zone Magazine, uh, amazing stories, weird tales, and I published these little short stories back in the 80s in these magazines, and that's how I got started. Do you remember your first one? And there, I do remember my first one. It was, it was in a magazine called GRU, G-R-U-E, uh, okay. which means, I think, to shudder. GRU, to, sh to, sh to shudder. I think it's an old archaic word that means to shudder or shiver. Something like that. But anyway, yeah, I got paid uh, one penny a word, and it was a story of about 2,500 words. So I made 25 <laughs> bucks, and I got paid uh, $25 and two copies of the magazine. But I still remember it vividly because it was my first. They're waving at me, my fans. I still, <laughs> I still remember it. Vivid. I remember the name of the editor, Peggy Nadramia, bless her heart. She was a, a, you know, really active in, the, in this field and brilliant editor. And this was her uh, sort of chap book. It was a small, it was, a, you know. In those days, people actually still, you know, in those days, people bought hard magazines off of racks and newsstands. It was a great age to start as a writer, you know. And in the 80s, the, in the 80s horror was huge. In the 1980s, we, you know, horror cinema was huge in the theater, and and there was a movement called the splatterpunk movement, which you know stemmed came from sort of people like Stephen King and Richard Matheson and, and Peter Straub. Then the splatterpunk movement occurred in the 80s, and it was really a, a goldmine for people like me who wrote this kind of stuff. I wrote I, my first novel was published in the early 90s. It was called The Black Mariah. And it was optioned uh, by New Line Cinema. It was uh, as a movie. Uh, there was a bidding war on it uh, between publishers. I started out really, um, you know, in a heady experience because uh, finally New Line got uh, 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 contracted uh, George Romero to direct the the movie version of my first novel. It was called oh, wow. The Black Mariah. It was about truck drivers, um, cross country truck drivers who are infected with a curse. Do you know the book? No. I've okay, don't worry. Don't, there's no shame in that. Sorry. It's impossible to find now. It's out of print. But at the time, it was it was it was pretty. It sold pretty well, and it was, uh, you know, it was going to be a movie. It was about these truck drivers who are infected with a, an ancient curse that prevents them from coming to a stop. Okay. If they try to stop moving, they burst into flames. <laughs> okay. You know. So, and right around that time, there was a movie called Speed in development. Oh, okay. Nobody had ever heard of this right. movie Speed. So we had this perpetual motion project. George Romero signed on to direct it. I co-wrote the script with Romero and another and another guy, Preston Whitmore. And it was an amazing experience. I hung out with George at his home and worked, collaborated with him. And as I said, that probably led to the job of Walking yeah. The Walking Dead. Yeah. Why right. I'm here today it was probably because of that. <laughs> cool. Now, if people want to follow you and Get more information from you. You have a website. I have a website. It's easy to find. It's jbonensinga.com. Just one word: www.jbonensinga.com. And uh, it's kind of a portal to all my Twitter feed and, and Facebook pages and stuff. Um, I have a, you know, I've directed films. I have a Facebook page for a film I directed called Stash. Oh, cool. 
Um, it was Marilyn Chambers' last film. Do you know who Marilyn, Marilyn Chambers is? Okay, that's a badge of honor. You should be proud that you don't know who she is because she was a famous porn actress. Uh, <laughs> that's my test of, of, of men of middle age, see if they're a pervert or not. Do you know who Marilyn Chambers oh, was? It was her last film she made before she passed away, bless her heart. Um, she was fabulous. She was a wonderful actress, and I got to work with her, you know, right before she died. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah. Jay All right, cool. All right, cool. Well, thanks for taking time <laughs> talking with us. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, a song about never saying never and never being told what you can or cannot do. This is one of us. Or when fighting got to me I lurked to find examples on the field of chivalry And I saw mighty arms much stronger than my arms could ever be So I thought perhaps that field was not for me But still I stayed and watched the fighting Till one figure stood apart In armor newly fashioned and a helm more pot than art But each blow was thrown with honor and the lightness of the heart so I took that step which soon became a start Cause she was not the biggest fighter Nor one to raise a fuss But I remember being proud that she was one of us And we might never stand together In a shield wall side by side Because of her I lift my sword with pride was ladylike and lively, not the type you would expect, with a braver heart than many and a slot shot to respect. And I guess she'd once decided this was where she'd like to be, and I thought if she could do it, why not?